so hi everybody. Uh, welcome to a special uh, interview we're doing today. Uh, I'm joined by uh, a, a gentleman named Dylan Murphy. So Dylan is a co-founder of a company called Wagner and Wolf. Uh, he's also an Australian and he comes from the big smoke of uh, Newcastle. Uh, so uh, Dylan, uh, Dylan and I have sort of been in contact over the last couple of years. Um, actually, one of our boys, uh, Dominic Niskimbum, has actually gone over with, uh, with Dylan. Um, so what Dylan focuses on and what Wagner Roof focuses on is the US uh, universe, uh, university and college system uh, and helping sort of provide that as a pathway for players, you know, not just as footballers, um, but also, you know, academically and studying and things like that. So um, Dylan's got a experience in playing in Australia um, and playing football and, and being around, obviously growing up here and, and playing at a decent level here in Australia. And so he's trying to help, you know, create that pathway over there. Uh, US system is growing professionally in terms of uh, the resources uh, and the, the players that they're attracting. Um, so it's definitely a, a growing market and definitely an option for, for players to look at as an alternative. Um, to, to what they may be looking for. So Dylan, thanks for your time. Thanks for joining us. No, no, no worries, Ken. Um, so first of all, how did uh, Wagner and Wolf come about? Yeah, well, I mean, I obviously went through um, the old N Swiss system um, in Australia, and the, you know, in Newcastle, and then into the kind of the, the Jets youth setup. Um, and, you know, the major challenge, obviously, in Australia is, is that you've got 10 teams it's extremely competitive a lot of good young players and 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 for a lot of players it was a it's a timing thing um not for me i would i definitely wasn't good enough to play in the a league but there were other guys who i thought probably if the timing was right may have got in you know depending on where that club is in the moment whether they're strong whether there's an opportunity for young players at that club that's a huge part of it when you've only got 10 teams sometimes the mentality is for clubs as well, if they're not good enough for X club, why would they be good enough for us? Which I think is a, a little bit of a silly way to look at it. Um, and after that point, you drop into the NPL setup. And, and again, you know, there's some, some fantastic players. The level's good. The issue then becomes, you know, progression. Um, how do you get back into full-time football? And I think that's the challenge for a lot of players. Um, so, so the initial option is, you know, a lot of players want to go to Europe who have a European passport. It's a, it's a jump, you know, at, at 19, 20, you know, clubs in Europe are, are looking for players to be contributing to the first team. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, if you can go over there and get a multi-year contract, then I think that's a great option. Um, but it's hard to develop on month to month contracts or in a league where there's a lack of stability you know, either at, a, at the corporate level at the club or, or on, you know, in the football department because, you know, the lower the level, the more turnover yeah. um, for the most part, right, as far as the whole club as, as a whole. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, well, I went to the US and, and I played, obviously, over here and had a great experience and there wasn't that many Australians over there at the time. Um, in New Zealand, it's been quite a popular pathway for, for a number of years. I mean, even going back to, to Ryan Nelson, who ended up having a very good career in the in the Premier League with Blackburn? Um, you know, he went through the college system, um, and a lot of the former All Whites had. Um, for Australians, it hadn't been popular, um, so we kind of started encouraging boys to look at it as a pathway, and and kind of at the same time, you know, the football is is uh, developing full time, you know, and, and and they're getting a degree in their life experience, which is a big part of it. Um, right living away from home. It's a different experience, obviously, in Australia. For the most part, you know, students at university still live at home because it's so expensive um, to rent, you know, in Sydney or Brisbane or wherever. Yeah. And, and that, that's, you know, that's lovely to be at home with your parents or, or family members. But I think there's a different challenge when you are living with friends or living by yourself. Yeah. Um, so when I came back at 22, briefly, I felt like I'd kind of experienced a lot in the four years since high school. Uh, faced a lot of adversity. Um, from a football standpoint, I, I definitely got a lot better. At that point in my life, I was ready to, to finish. I was, you know, get to married and whatever. Um, but I definitely felt like I'd experienced a lot and was ready for life yeah. going forward, as opposed to maybe some of my friends who I thought, you know, they, they still had a lot less responsibility 
um, and a lot of kind of, you know, still parental involvement in their lives. Um, yeah. That's it. No, I, thought, I think for the college system, it's great for your football. Uh, I think if, if, you, if your mentality is, I want to be a professional tomorrow, it's not the right pathway. I think it's definitely a process over here. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a, a lot of opportunity, as you alluded to. The clubs over here are growing very quickly. Um, but I think to come over, you've got to look at it as a you know, two to four year plan um, yeah. on your football. And at the same time, making sure that you're you know, building the other areas of your life, you know, whether it's your academics, whether it's your social life, whether it's you know, life skills and making sure that within that three or four year period, there's a significant amount of growth, you know, football wise, academic wise, personal uh, wise from, from when you started. Yeah. Uh, Like, so, you know, um, obviously since you've been over there, what are some of the big changes that you've seen with the, with the systems and the programs that, you know, they've been implementing? So is it, you know, that there's more resources going into uh, like coaching or the, or the facilities being provided? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of, you know, athletic directors are looking at soccer as a, a sport, of, uh, you know, a sport for the future. Uh, I think on the women's side over here, it's been popular for a long time, obviously. Um, but on the men's side, I think they look at some of, some of the other sports that just have challenges. I mean, it's the same with some of the sports in Australia. I mean, a lot of uh, young families that aren't, just with all this the information coming out around the, the injuries of the brain with American football, and those heavy contact sports, I think a lot of parents are concerned about getting their kids involved in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you look at other challenges like baseball, which is, you know, a, it's a different generation of kids. They want to be involved, you know, a lot more, a lot more, a lot more action. Sometimes those sport, those slower sports can have a challenge. So I think that it's, um, I think it's a sport for the future. I think um, it's a changing dynamic in America. I mean, certain states have, have huge, a lot of, you know, uh, different cultures, especially in, in, in parts of California and Texas with, with huge Hispanic populations yeah. um, and, and football is their sport. Um, so I think there's a lot more interest. I think that, that there's a lot more foreign players coming into the system. Um, what sort of areas are those players coming from? Uh, everywhere. 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 I mean, yeah. you've got players coming from, you know, top Bundesliga academies, Premier League academies, um, you know, all over South America, it, you know, they, they, it's if you come into a kind of normal Division One program, yeah. you're going to have six or seven, eight different nationalities in the team. Yeah, that's you know? quite an experience. Yeah, I mean it's it's you know different different players from La Liga, uh, clubs. So they look at it, I think, and they go, "Well, I'm in the under 19s at call it RP Leipzig, and I'm not going to get a first team contract." So mm-hmm. now, what is my option? Do I drop into the fourth league, which is still considered professional in Germany, but it's yeah. definitely, you know, on the fringe, yeah. uh, or the fifth league, and depending on the club? Um, or do I, you know, use my football to create an opportunity in the US um, to, to, you know, experience a, a very good level, travel the country, great resources, get an education and, and experience life? Uh, and there's been a few players that have come over, well, a lot, that have, you know, really who thought at 19 football was over for them, mm-hmm. um, who have done well. I mean, Fabian Herbers was a German player who was, had an interview with the MLS uh, the other day who, yeah. who came over and played at Creighton. And, and he sort of commented that he thought football was finished uh, yeah. from a professional standpoint and obviously went back into the professional system in the US So after college. So yeah. it's Is not there... a perfect system, but I think it's in the right direction. Is there is there sort of a is there some sort of pathway that's developed for uh, players? You know, when they finish their their scholarship or the and the university footballing thing, is there a way to for a transition way into the MLS or for MLS clubs to see these kids? <coughs> yeah, I mean, I always whenever players ask me about that, it, yeah. it's 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 always it's difficult because there's a lot of good players, you know, and I think yeah. the American academy system is 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 headed in the right direction as well. Yeah. Um, because for the most part, at the MLS Academy level, most of those players are going to go to college. Only yeah. the top one or two, probably per, per age group, is going to continue towards that either MLS or USL yeah. club um, first team and, and not go to college. You know, there'll be cases where some players turn down an initial pro contract yeah. to go to college, knowing that that, that pathway is still open for them down the line at that yeah. club. Um, 
So I think the, the biggest advantage for college players I see is the growth of the USL, which is the second league over here. Yeah. Because I think the MLS has gotten you know, stronger and stronger every year. Uh, and sometimes, depending on the club, uh, that jump from college to MLS can be a big jump. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so I think the USL growing and, and, and having more independent franchises, that's really, you know, become a really good kind of bridge yeah. um, to the MLS. Yeah, there's plenty of players that do make the jump initially and it works. Um, but I think that for a lot of them, the USL is going to act as a really good, you know, stopover point. Yeah. Um, where you're playing with men, professionals, you know, uh, and there's an adjustment there. Uh, and I mean, if you look at the A League where that fits, it's going to vary team to team. But someone like most most of the movement between the United States professional system and the A League has been through the USL. Mm-hmm. Um, so like Harrison Delbridge was at Cincinnati, which is a very strong USL club who are now an MLS club. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's gone back to Melbourne City. Uh, there's been a couple other examples. Uh, Marcus Flores, I think, at one point when he left the Newcastle Jets, went to the US, um, into the USL. Um, there's, there's been a, you know, there's been a couple, couple so examples. Is that is that link there where obviously the the competition and and the, in the US is growing hugely, um, you know, and, yeah. it, and it's getting stronger and stronger. So that that jump from there to there is becoming harder. So now that that's where you know you're seeing sort of the USL fit that fit that sort of gap yeah um, and even that the quality of that and the professional of that is, is obviously growing in that as well, well i think no promotion relegation so i yeah. think a lot of uh, the mls decides who becomes an mls club yeah. and i think usl clubs look at it and say okay if we're in a market like sacramento who's recently joined yeah. the mls um if we're in a market like that and we show that we're commercially feasible uh-huh. um maybe we'll get the tap on the shoulder to, to make the jump yeah. So everyone's really working hard to show that they they fit the criteria to to be an MLS club, um, and, and having those outcomes both on and off the field to to show that. Um, but I think, as I said, I think that it's growing. San Diego's just got a team. You know, this team now in Birmingham, Alabama. Matthew McConaughey's just invested in a team in Austin, Texas. Um, so I think it is definitely headed in the right direction. And they've got the population base over here to really uh, fund that. Um, so, I mean, you look at the state of California, you know, 40, you know, about 40 million people, um, and they've only got four teams. Yeah. You know, uh, we're obviously in Australia, we've got half population and double the teams. Yeah, that's a- that which, which becomes the commercial challenge. Yeah. Um- where does so going back a little bit to to where Wagner and Wolf sit and and what your role? So what's what's your key role and where you fit into the into this sort of system? Yeah, I, I well, think that you know we're 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 not agents. Um, it's more a case of really helping the players navigate the process. You know, yep. um, navigate. You know, where do I fit in the system? Um, what what what's my academic goals? What are my football goals? You know, what, what, what do I want out of this experience? And kind of helping them navigate that process. Um, it's not a sense of, you know, when we're, we're not professional agents. It's not about that. It's more a case of more like, you know, advisors with, with, with the academics and helping them understand the process with their football. Yeah. And then, that sort of, and then so you provide that link between them and then helping them find, helping them find sort yeah, of the right direction. To different colleges and, and making sure that we, you know, um, that they they're, they're compliant with all of the NCAA rules and yep. and going from there. How have you find so? Um, obviously, you spoke about you know the, the 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 women's system growing over there. Are you finding there's more sort of uh, you know obviously there's there's more female professional players going overseas and and a lot of them are going to America or now they're going to England uh, and coming back. Are you finding that's that's a big sort of growth area where like especially with female footballers? Yeah, I mean, female football in Australia is a tricky one. Um, and there's different voices, you know. A lot of them are saying, you know, j- jump into England or jump into Germany or wherever. Yeah. I, I think it really depends on where you are. I mean, if yeah. you're already a builder um, at 16, 17, maybe your best option is to jump into yeah. to a professional environment. If you're already playing for the national team, I think for the girls that, that aren't at yeah. that age or girls that are in the young Matildas, 
my advice would be go to college because yeah. um, you can really leverage your football to get a great degree and an experience. At the end of it, you're only going to be 21 and you've got 10 more years to, to play. I also think that, you know, we don't have the full-time environments in Australia that, that they have on offer at some of these colleges. Yeah. And that and when I talk about full-time, it's not about just training three or four sessions a week. It's everything with strength and conditioning and all of the stuff that goes with that to really prepare an athlete to make that full-time professional jump um, and, and give them that longevity. Yeah. Um, so I think for, for the girls, they really should be coming to the U.S., um, yeah. All of the U.S. national team women, well, I'll say 99.99%, uh, they're going to college. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not thinking about going to the U.K. Like, the idea is I go to college at wherever, whatever college that, that I fit in, yeah. uh, and then from there I can really focus on my development for three or four years. Uh, and a lot of national teams around the world use the college system as their development phase plan. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's... It makes, it makes a lot of sense. I, I can't see the, the rationale in, in jumping into a, a contract in Europe yeah. um, that is financially certainly not going to leave you with much after you finish. Yeah. What, with the, with the, the men's program and, and sort of what sort of age groups are you looking at for, you know, the, the boys yeah, so and what level yeah, are they playing usually? It's different, it's different men's to women's. Um, the women's recruitment is definitely done much earlier over here because yeah. the recruitment... As I said, the, the top U.S. girls are going to college. So, so college coaches over here, here will, will look at them kind of years in advance. Yeah. Um, and they'll say, um, you know, uh, you know, she's 16, next player. I know she's coming to college. She's really good. Let's have that conversation when the NCAA allows that communication to start. Yeah. Um, on the men's side, there's a little bit, there's a lot more foreign players as a percentage of the entire playing group. Um, a lot of those players are in academies up until they come. Um, and I think that changes it. Also, the top MLS academy kids, some of them may get the tap on the shoulder to, to come with the first team and they don't go the college route. So yeah. there's, it's a bit of a less stable recruitment market, which means a lot of it is done year to year. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, they're both they're, they're very different. Um, so, so for the girls, I would say, you know, start looking at the process at 16. Yeah. Um, on the boys' side, you know, 17, 17, probably a year, year 16, 17 for both. But it really depends on, on where they're at, whether they're, they're 100% committed to that process. Yeah. Um, but the girls is definitely probably a year to 18 months earlier. Okay. Yeah. But maybe, maybe year 10 for the girls. Year, year 10, 10 yeah. for the girls, year 11 for the guys. Yeah. So it gives them that time to them to them prepare. Um, yeah, so and I think for the girls, from a, go on, sorry. Yeah, go on, go on. No, from a level standpoint, I think for the boys, if you, you know, it really, again, it depends on where you're looking to go. Um, yeah. if you can be playing to the 20s in the NPL. I think that's a good base. Uh, and then anything beyond that is going to put you in a really strong position. Um, now, certain, certain positions like goalkeeper is a good one where yeah. sometimes it's just hard as, an, as a 17-year-old to be playing 20s as a goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a little bit of a different conversation. Um, and then for the girls, I think it's close. They can get to playing first grade at sort of 16, 17, 18 yeah. in the MPL structure, the, the better. Yeah, definitely. It gives them, gives them that advantage. Um, really appreciate your time today, Dylan. Um, I hope, make sure you go and check out Wagner and Wolf and what they do. I've known uh, a few players that have gone over and dealt with Dylan themselves and ha had a really great experience. Uh, from going over and that not just from their footballing side but from the academic side and as Dylan spoke about their life skills and that's a really important thing that you know we, we have to develop um, you know what you know how Dylan goes about it is in our and his you know his fellow people at, at Wagner and Wolf go about it is is really positive uh, they provide some great support um, and, and as I said it's we only get sort of really positive feedback from the people that we speak speak to about their experiences, not only with, you know, Wagner and Wolf, but about with the, you know, where the US system is going. So um, make sure you check them out, um, follow them. If you, if you, you want some more information, um, you know, get in touch. And uh, yeah, look, Dylan, thanks very much for your time, mate. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and, great uh, to we look forward to speaking to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, mate.